so what we might do is I can start taking people through some of the ideas of appreciative inquiry just because I'm lucky um, that I know a little bit about it and I notice that there are some people here like Chris and Nivek who are also noticing some specific things. So we'll start by taking you through what we can about appreciative inquiry while Martin um, has a bit of an argument with his email um, so that he can click on the final link to, to log in. Um, and my apologies for that. So let me just start by screen sharing a little bit about the 4D cycle of appreciative inquiry. So the idea behind appreciative inquiry is this 4D cycle. So appreciative inquiry is about choosing a topic that you want to see improvement and growth on. Um, and so the first part of the cycle that you get involved in is you discover what it is that um, makes that issue already have life, um, already has meaning, what already works well um, in that particular topic area. So let's say you were choosing um, a particular council and an idea around the environment in that council, you could ask the question, what do we already do well for the environment in this council? Or what is it that people like the most about the environment in this council? So this is a very discovery phase that is focused not so much on what people don't like about the environment or, not, or what's not being done well, but actually focuses on what is being done well and what gives life. Um, and, and the idea behind that is appreciating. For the, so for those of you who know finances, you would know that when we talk about money appreciating, we talk about it um, increasing or improving. And the idea behind appreciative inquiry is similar, that um, things will increase and improve over that time. The second phase is dreaming. And that says, what might it be? So again, taking a particular council who might want to do something about the environment. Instead of saying, what do you not like? You say, so we already appreciate that we do these things well with the environment. What else would we like to see being done well with the environment? What do we think we could um, improve on? What could we reach towards? Uh, what Martin used to say when he trained me, what would you smell, see, taste, touch, feel if you're walking down the street in 10 years and we had implemented a good environmental plan? What would you see? Would you see more trees? Would you see more birds? Um, you know, is it that you wouldn't see smoke? Um, you know, what, what is it that you would or wouldn't see? So that you can be quite tactile about that, but also quite future visioned in what you dream about that. And then from that stage, you move on to the next stage, which is called designing. And you look at designing what should be the ideas. So in order to get to not seeing smoke in the main street or in order to get to having trees in the main street or in order to, I don't know, not see rubbish at the beach or whatever it is that's in that environmental strategy, what you know, what ideal do we have and how do we agree on that? And then how do we actually start designing a plan to deliver that? So is it going to be a planting day? Is it going to be a contract with a nursery? And that starts moving into the next phase, which you can see here, which is delivery. How do we empower and learn and adjust and imp improvise towards that solution? So uh, let's take the example of seeing um, trees in a main street for an environmental plan. Um, how do we empower the community to do that? How do we empower the council to do that? What is it that's creating the limitations that we need to um, give people some ability to change? Um, and then as we um, realise that, say, for example, um, trees in the main street, maybe it comes up against something like disability access or maybe it comes up against water restrictions, how do we empower people when we have this competing thing that makes trees in the street more difficult than we thought. Maybe we change the trees that we plant, how are we learning from what we've done, um, how are we adjusting what we're doing, maybe we change the way that we water, maybe we change where the trees are placed in terms of access and, um, and then through noticing what those problems are, learn so that we can still keep our vision for trees in the main street but we also can adjust, um, learn what stops us having trees in the main street and find ways to work around those problems and sustain that solution once the trees have gone into the main street. So that's the first idea um, in terms of the practice of the 4D um, cycle of appreciative inquiry. There's a couple of other things that need to be noted about appreciative inquiry. Um, the first one is that appreciative inquiry appreciates and values the best of what is. So when I first started in community development, 
I was actually um, in the opposite position to this. I was um, being taught to ask the community what their needs were and what their deficits were and what their problems were. And it was quite a shock to me to start moving towards appreciating and valuing the best of what was. And the second thing is uh, working towards envisaging what might be. So instead of looking at what happened in the past, you start looking more towards the future and you start talking about what, not only what could be, but what it is that you want to be. The next principle is dialogue, um, what should be. So not everyone will necessarily agree on what might be and um, in particular what they want to be. So for example, trees in the main street may be something that some people don't want because they are afraid that it might drop onto their cars, have damage on their cars, things like that. So that's where the discussion comes about, about what should be. Now it might change what the design looks like initially. Um, it might be about getting discussion and consensus around that. Um, and then innovating is once you actually get to a point where you have discussion and, dis and consensus around what should be, you start innovating with what will be. And the assumption of appreciative inquiry is that organisations and, um, you know, in this case, communities are mysteries that are to be discovered. And the mystery that's to be discovered is why are things working as well as they are and what is it that people would like to see in the future and, and how, how are we going to get there? And um, it starts right at that beginning of saying what, what is it that we want? And it thinks about possibilities. Most, um, most of the time when we ask questions of community groups, we actually are deficit focused. And um, there are, and so for example, a deficit qu focus question could be uh, starting with what are you not happy with? It could start with what would you like to see changed? Um, it depends on how, how that's worded, but it could certainly be that. Uh, it could be um, what are the three big problems that you'd like to see addressed in your community or what makes you unhappy? Um, what are the needs of this community? Uh, what uh, resources and services do we need, for example? And look, that's pretty common questioning and it's often um, done that way because funding bodies tend to fund places that don't have particular resources. So it's that we don't have a hospital or we don't have a swimming pool or we don't have a cultural and arts centre or, you know, we don't have focused. And there are some serious consequences to working in that way, which I know the, the benefits are obviously that um, the whole system is set up to work that way, but the consequences of not working that way include um, fragmentation of the community. So um, because you notice the deficit, different people will start um, blaming different people in the system. Why is it that the rubbish isn't collected? Well, that's the council's fault. No, it's the um, individuals in the community who throw the rubbish's fault. No, it's the, and we could go on and on. It's the school children. It's the, I don't know, whatever it is that want to be blamed. Um, the second de problem with deficit focused uh, issues is that there are um, a few um, images of possibility. So you don't really get an idea of what could be or what people want. You just get an idea of what people don't want. And, and I think I remember learning this quite clearly um, once when I was working with Aboriginal communities around uh, people on the riverbank. And um, we spent so much time talking about um, the Aboriginal communities living on the riverbank and the drinking problems and the crime problems associated with that, that we didn't actually spend the time saying, well, what is it that you do want? And when those questions were asked, we had a completely different process and we had a completely different outcome and there were specific services that were wanted and there were specific um, programs that were wanted and so um, and, and also appreciation of some of the things that the people on the riverbank could be doing to participate in society. Um, the next problem, I guess, um, in the normal problem of deficit focus is that negative frames can become very self-fulfilling. So if you notice all the problems with your community, you put that into reports, you say, you know, we uh, have a higher level of unemployment, for example, um, then that has an ability to, create, to make itself more self-fulfilling. Um, it doesn't um, necessarily attract new businesses to that area. It doesn't necessarily do any of those things. Instead, what it does is um, it has people start accepting that unemployment is an option. Um, it's also pretty exhausting to listen to complaints all the time. 
um, and having a voice that's purely always explaining why things are the way they are rather than having a vision for the future can be quite exhausting. And it also leads to uh, people to wanting experts to fix everything and not actually taking part in the process themselves for saying this is what it should look like and this is how we'd like to see it. And I guess finally um, it starts weakening the fabric of relationships and leads to defensiveness and negative cultures which is a little bit like the first point of fragmentation. And last of all it's quite slow and it puts attention on yesterday's causes you know why things have happened rather than on tomorrow's ideas and the thing that you can't really change much is the past but you can have some influence over the future and so this negative um, deficit focus also tends to reduce the energy that goes towards the future so i'm just wondering if um, any people have any questions about that at the moment or any comments in relation to that did people see that so far that part of the presentation? So I'll just pull out some of the comments that people have made. So Chris, for example, talked about um, the 4D model and being positive and strength focused. So you're completely right about that. If you can hold on for just one second while I wait for your comments, I will just see if I can get hold of Martin here and find out what the problem is. All right, there I am. I'm here. I think we've got you're it. Up. You're here. So Martin, um, while, um, while we had some technical difficulties um, and apologies to people, um, what we did was we went through some of the basic principles of appreciative inquiry um, and we talked particularly about the 4D cycle, um, yep. so the discover, de dream, design and deliver. And we yes. also talked about um, valuing what is, what might be, what should be, um, looking at it as a mystery to discover and the start to the process and we talked about the consequences of focusing on the deficit. Right. Um, so what we might do is because I'm really interested to hear sort of what your perspective is on this is that we might actually just do the quick um, share to the first one which is this question about when did you discover, um, when did you first of appreciative inquiry why do you like it so much i know you're obsessed when you saw us so and that was 10 years ago nearly now so <laughs> that's right um okay so look i just to explain a bit about myself so that people have some context um i'm an independent consultant working um, in local government and state government basically um and I was asked by a, a, a colleague, another consultant, to come and assist with um, a, a process looking at um, catchment management issues um, in uh, southwestern Sydney. And he used appreciative inquiry um, to actually, uh, as a, as a, a process uh, basis for the workshop that we ran, um, to, act, to find out what people um, valued most about their the natural environment sort of within this catchment area so having come away from that um that was at around about the time when local government in new south wales was just starting to get very active in um with integrated planning um which required lots of community engagement and such so i um thought that the appreciative inquiry process after doing some research on it uh, I was certain that appreciative inquiry could be adapted to community visioning, um, uh, those kind of exercises to put together long-term community plans. And when I did further research on it, I saw that on, on there was a lot of information online about how appreciative inquiry had been, had started off as a process for organisational change. So it was originally used as a process uh, by, by organisations um, that were going through sort of change management stuff changing uh, organisational structure. And uh, it was a process used in that context to sort of bring staff along on that sort of journey of change. And so I adapted it and, and developed a, an appreciative inquiry process for communities and community visioning. Um, and 
um, rolled that out across well over a dozen councils that were going through this integrated planning process. So getting communities involved in developing long-term plans, high-level visioning, um, and well, I mean, Joe, you know, you, you as a, as someone who witnessed the whole process, uh, you, you know, you'll be able to comment on this, but it, it was across the board extremely successful. I'd have to say, immodestly. Yeah. yeah, look, I mean, for me, and I was saying this before you got on, as someone who had been trained in community development to start out and ask the question, what are we missing from our community and what do we not need? Mm. Um, it was a, a fairly big shift, but I think it's a shift that I came to really appreciate probably because I have training in a therapy background, which is completely different to what your background is in modelling. Um, but again, in the therapy background, the shift in thinking is moving towards noticing what people already have that work well. And I, I agree with you, watching it roll out in Cross Richmond Valley when we did that was quite powerful to see what it was that the community wanted. Yes. And look, appreciative inquiry, the, the basis of appreciative inquiry is quite simple, really. It's sort of, sort of startlingly simple, really, because it, the basis of it is a philosophy that, that if you, if you basically uh, engage people on a basis of, of, of identifying what works, what is successful, what do we value, then those, those things that communities identify then become the building blocks for the future. So a lot of engagement processes tend to fall into a bit of a trap of asking the question in general, what what is broken? What do we need to fix? But the, what happens when you actually go down that path is that um, communities and, and the, the discussion in general tends to become focused on all the negative things, all the bad things, everything that doesn't work and so on. And so if you actually apply this very strong philosophy of let's acknowledge the good things, let's acknowledge what works, let's acknowledge what we want, what we value, uh, then you've got some building blocks for the future. So in that, in that process that I um, rolled out amongst all those councils, we couldn't ignore, we couldn't just bypass things that people, uh, uh, you know, the broken things, the things that, that, that the, the problem areas. But it was a matter then of asking a question. And, and if you do research on appreciative inquiry, you will find, um, that it is it is all locked up in a, in a very carefully designed questioning process. So even when you actually ask the questions that kind of take people into thinking about the negative, you know, anything that's broken that needs fixing, you can ask those questions in a very positive way. So what the way that I framed, you know, the one question in this whole process, and so we, we did these sort of three hour, um, uh, sort of community forums, and there was one question in that in that uh, in in each forum that that was posed, and that question was, you know, what do we most need to improve to to take us to a better place? To actually, um, you know, to to um, you know, that I can't remember the exact nature of the question, but but it was basically, what do we most need to improve? here. So that was trying to address the, the broken bits, the broken things and so on, but but in a in a positive way. And so even it comes down to sort of um, a, a, a principle that is as simple as, you know, if you get people talking positively, then, you know, people will think positively and they will provide positive feedback. So even framing that question, you know, rather than saying what's broken, what do we need to fix? Sort of saying, what would you? What most needs attention? What most needs to be improved? What are the? What are? Where? Where is the most room for improvement? Um, so even that question, which could have gone into the negative, was framed in a positive way. And any research that you do into appreciative inquiry will highlight the fact that it's a careful process of uh, design in terms of the questions that you ask. Yeah. So, um, Martin, just um, considering the time, the next question that we we're going to ask you um, was when did you discover appreciative inquiry and why do you like it so much and what is appreciative inquiry? I feel like we've sort of covered those questions. 
Um, yep. Is there anything you wanted to add to either of those questions before we sort of go on? Um, look, just the fact that if you, if 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 anybody listening is not sort of um, needs more kind of convincing about these philosophies that underpin appreciative inquiry, do some research on 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 it for yourselves on on the internet, and you will see that there are now uh, appreciative inquiry. Um, uh, Groups. There are websites that are devoted just to this methodology, um, and so on. So it's actually in a in a very quite a short time gained huge traction amongst um, leaders in the whole engagement field. Yeah. Um. So we have a bit of a question here, which I might pose now because I think it's quite relevant to what you're just saying, and it's. I guess it's sort of the opposite in some sense. It's Mary and she's saying that she has a different perspective as a counsellor. She finds it paramount to engage with the community, but a lot of the engagement is with naysayers. And yes. regardless of being um, what's being said, we have found the best strategy is to listen and to get back to each person. How would you, um, how would you sort of comment on that? Um, <coughs> look, the, the, this, there's a couple of things that need to be considered here in that, firstly, the, you know, it's, it's the, the usual suspects is, the issue, is one of the issues here that you need to consider. So it's about how you actually, even before you've actually, apply, you know, you design your methodology, that's a separate issue. So you choose appreciative inquiry as a method. But if you actually need to take a step back and say, how do we actually cast our net wider to get to attract people you know who are not the usual suspects because the naysayers tend to be the the usual suspects in terms of any engagement processes you know there is a core group in any uh in in any community um processes who are kind of always involved you know they want to be involved and and so on this, so it's a it's about casting the net wider and and using a broader uh set of processes to actually get people involved and and timing one of the things that we did when we um did these community forums all over new south wales was to make sure that we gave people every opportunity to be involved so we did uh engagement activities at different times of the the day you know weekdays weekday evenings weekends and so on so you give people opportunities to be involved once they actually come along and we were getting what uh, Joe, as I recall it, anywhere between 60 and 100 people to each of the four forums that we ran in, in the Richmond Valley area. Yeah, I so, think we counted seven to 800 people in total that we engaged with. Yeah, that's right, which is, which is, a, which is a lot bearing in mind the overall population. Um, so secondly, once you actually do get the people in the room, no matter who they are, and, and even the naysayers, what you do is you upfront. You don't just ask these questions by stealth. Um, what I did was I got up and and um, started each forum with an acknowledgement of the way we were going to run the forum and the questions we were going to ask. So I said to them, "Look, um, I, from memory, my my opening remarks were something like, you know, welcome to this forum." Uh, you know, we have a we have a limited amount of time together, and the purpose of this is to envision, to develop a vision for a, a, a better Richmond Valley in that case, or you know, a better wherever you know, a better better community and a better a better environment. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus only on positives because if we can identify what the best things. Uh, that are around us in terms of community, in terms of natural environment, in terms of, you know, um, services and facilities and that. If we identify the best, then we, we know what we need to preserve and we can build on that. So it's a matter of upfront acknowledging how we're going to run this process. And even, and Joe, as someone who witnessed these, these, uh, these forums was present in, in, in all of them, I'm sure you'd agree that even the naysayers, there was one particular naysayer 
but uh, he attended every one of those four forums and drove a long way to get there and and his purpose in doing that he said was you know to keep the council honest to make sure the council was honest now in the end i had he i had him helping providing assistance in the forums in describing how this process was going to work and i ha he was actually the most vocal supporter i remember yeah he was explaining to to all and sundry how the process was work w would work and how important it was to actually participate uh in the process at, at, you know according to that the design of that process so uh this was the guy who was the council area's biggest serial pest and he was absolutely and utterly on board now that's not to say he stayed on board because he you know went on later on to to you know cause further problems with this process but there and then in those forums under the appreciative inquiry process he was a total supporter so and and i guess sort of in summary of that it, it's quite easy when you have naysayers um to say i'll take your concerns back and i think that what mary's doing is really valid in doing that i think it's important for her to say i am listening i'm going to act on it but i think the second part of that is that it's really important to say what is it that you would like because it's really easy when people are telling you what they don't like to imagine what they would like but actually you might find that for example they're not happy about the potholes and then if you say oh well we'll get them filled which seems like an obvious solution then they might be unhappy about um, the amount of money that's spent on the filling or they might be unhappy with um, you know the noise in their street or the time that the filling happens so you know mm. the more specific you can get about what you want the more helpful um, but yes, a couple of other, yeah, sorry go on oh just just with those kind of things because a lot of council business revolves around those kind of practicalities the potholes the the you know all that sort of stuff the the the, the, um, the, the road repairs which aren't being done and so on so but when you actually when we actually started the forums, we sort of said, look, you know, a, a number of you will have come here to have specific issues addressed, to have, you know, and they may be long-standing issues. And a lot of them may be entirely val valid, but I will say to you now that this is not going to be the forum to do that. And the reason is that we have a certain, only a certain amount of time together. We have to make the most of this time and therefore we're going to focus on the positive we're talking to, you know building a 20-year plan we need to know what you value we need to know the best of what there is and and then i sort of said look you know we have uh, breaks here all of the councillors are here which they which they inevitably were the senior staff catch those staff during the breaks and use use the the free time opportunities to pursue these issues but in discussion we need to actually follow a particular process here. And then I sort of put up a, 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 um, a slide on the screen, sort of, 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 you know, some discussion guidelines, how we're going to actually, and said, does everybody agree that this is how we're going to use this session? You know, and, and, and it was some guidelines just about hearing everybody out, that everybody has, uh, you know, everybody's opinions have equal weight and, and so on. Everybody accepted it always. So um, what I would sort of say, just in closing off this point, is that so much about engagement is how you run it there and then in the room with people at the time. So it's, it, is, it is about the design, of course, over, over the top of everything, but how you run these processes in the room at the time is absolutely critical to, to their success. Yeah. Yep. So this is a real quick one that we can knock um, over, I, I guess, but I'll just post it. Um, Kerry Baker said it would be really great to receive a list of recommended online sites. So if you and I talk afterwards, when we send out the recording, we can send out a couple of sites that you're recommending that people do their, some research on. Yes, that, by all means. Yeah, for sure. So um, we have a question from Marie that says, how do you get something started without having a three hour session? Um, you know, getting people to attend for that long and getting attention span, etc., um, can be difficult. Yeah, look, it it depends. It's hard to answer that question without knowing the specifics, and it's hard to sort of, um, it's hard to look. You know, you wouldn't actually use appreciative inquiry when you are when if you kind of looked at a small kind of town committee and they had you know 
a pot of money and how do you want to you know how do you want this money to be expended i mean the appreciative inquiry won't work in 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 every single um context um it, it, it's more going to be uh something that you use for the to to gain people's input into bigger picture things sort of big picture long-term far-reaching visioning stuff um so you know, but but three hours, um, three hours is a long time, and it is you know you do keep your three hour uh, powder dry for those bigger bigger events. Um, but I, I'm so without knowing exactly what you're trying, what you need to do, it's hard to answer that that question in terms of the you know applying a pressure of inquiry. Other than to come back to the basic principles of identifying the best of what is to dream of or imagine or design what can be, what could be in the future. I mean, that's a very simple principle, you know? Choose, uh, identify the best of what is, i.e. what we have now, as a means to, to, to uh, create a vision of what could be. Yep. So we have another question here, which I'm thinking has been answered, um, but if you wanted to ex expand just a little, it's from Kate. And Kate was saying that she was really interested in hearing what strategies you use to get the community to focus on what is good um, in the discovery phase, um, rather than being treated as if you're ignoring the issues. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> okay, so open-ended questions are are it. Open-ended questions are absolutely what you need what you need to to ask. So rather than saying, "Do you think this, that, and the other?" answer yes or no, you sort of uh, you you your questions are designed such that people can take it wherever they want. So so what happened was we would uh, we asked a question of what are the best features. So features could be anything of. Uh, that you know of 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 this area where you live, um, so people would come back and sort of say to some people their idea of the best features were you know lots of um, lots of undeveloped um, uh, you know pristine rainforest or uh, or uh, bushland. Others would come back and say you know we have uh, a, a, a fabulous and strong community spirit. Um, others would say you know we have a great uh, we have access to a lot of different um, um, sporting clubs and facilities and so on. So people made of that question whatever they wanted. Um, and then it was after that that we started to, after, when we got all this data, then we started to categorise it into different, um, you know, I think seven different categories that, that sort of spoke to, that covered absolutely everything that would happen in, in the council area. Um, so it's really just a matter of, of you know, asking the open-ended questions and letting people do their own interpretation. Letting, um, because if you've got enough people in the room, you know, you'll get a very broad spread. And then you, use, you can use prompters. You, know, you can sort of say, think about if you're getting some, you know, not getting much feedback from that, sort of say to them, all right, well, when you're actually considering this question, what are the best features of, of, the, um, of the, the, say, the, you know, the Kayama, council area and its community um, then you've just sort of said okay so you've done you've you've provided two prompters in that question the area and the community so the area speaks more to the physical or the you know the, the actual the land form um, the natural environment that sort of all the, and the built environment and the community speaks more to the people and what the people have done or what the people are doing you know, uh, and then if you're still getting quiet things, you come back to, you know, you, you can sort of say to them, think about this in terms of the natural environment or in terms of the services uh, and facilities that there are um, around here and so on. So you're giving prompters and you're giving some structure. You're providing some structure to their thinking without actually directing them in any particular way. So, so it's very important. Look. The thing about this is that you have to be, you have to really get your head around the process if you're running these kind of sessions because you have to be able to come up with, you know, um, prompters without pushing people in any direction or answering the question for people, you know. Yep. So we have a question, I guess, that leads directly on from that from Chris. And he basically says, is there not a danger of just creating more of the same of what you have if you just get people to appreciate whatever it is that they have? 
No, because the question uh, about what do we most need to improve is right in there in the mix. So that gives people, that's people's opportunity to sort of, uh, you know, uh, turn their minds to um, real improvements, you know, and or, come back in the local that says what you know what do you vision for the future because i remember that you were really strong on saying what is it that you would see in 10 years if it was the way you wanted it or what would you taste or smell or you know what would you actually how would you know that this would change that's right what yeah yeah what what um and it was very it was a very real sort of thing we sort of said what what in 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 the world that you know the better better world that you envision for your local area what what it describe things that you can see here and touch and smell you know so that brought people in the context there was you know reality they would describe things they wouldn't sort of say oh we you know we want uh you know more we um uh we want better roads you know what they would say is i want to drive on a on a road where there's no potholes or a road that has been graded uh, on a regular basis so it's really smooth and that sort of thing or uh, I want to hear, you know, a, 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 you know, a myriad of different bird calls, or I want to smell uh, the, uh, you know, the 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 the, uh, the the smell of, you know, clean country air, that sort of stuff, you know. I want to hear uh, silence because we have a, a heavy vehicle bypass, you know, that sort of thing. So it doesn't take very much for to get people to actually, you know, start. You to, uh, provide you with a picture based on reality rather than just these kind of blanket statements of we want better roads, we want more facilities, we want uh, you know better schools and hospitals. You can get you can take people well beyond that without working too hard. So um, I've got a couple of basic questions which I'll just cover. I will make sure I send out the slides afterwards. Um, there's been a couple of people asking about that as well as the links. Um, and I've got a couple of comments that are more comments than questions, but I might just broadcast them as well. So Navek was saying, for example, that my experience is that similar to this is similar to visioning with the addition of specifically identifying and reflecting on the things you're already working on well, um, so that you can build on your strengths. Would you say that that was a fair call? Or yes, but the thing that stands out to me there is is you know you're not you wouldn't use this process to, to form a, a specific report card for an organization you know this is this is about the outside world you know so it's not a question of what we're doing well you wouldn't go out and sort of say to people what's the best of what we provide for you it's it's it, you kind of neutralize it and you you throw it out well beyond your own your own borders um, certainly you can bring things in there, but if it's open-ended and you're asking open-ended questions, if, if something is at the forefront, forefront of people's mind, if they've been, you know, if, if a government authority, be it a council or a state government department or something, has been making them really uh, angry for many years and you ask the question, what do we most need to improve here? They'll give you that answer because it's in their minds. You just need to trust their capacity to actually provide an answer to that question you know, without guiding them at all. So it sounds like part of this process is actually about turning the question or turning the comments that are common around so that people see a way forward rather than what it is they didn't like in the past. Yes. Yes. And, and really to bring people around to be thinking positively, working together to you know in the, the the discussion forum or that sort of thing to whatever the whatever the whatever the venue is because the thing is we applied these appreciative inquiry questions to written surveys as well and so we we were able to glean data that was consistent uh or within a structure that was consistent with the the community forums that we ran so purely by emulating those questions on a survey in, a, in in the context of a written survey so it's very you know it's very um, flexible very flexible this this kind of um, this kind of format and and uh, you know as it comes back to what I was saying about some very careful design uh, to, to really be able to understand appreciative inquiry 
and adapt it carefully to get the outcomes that you need. Yep. So I guess um, coming back to Marie's original question about, you know, how do you do it if you don't have three hours? Part yep. of your answer is saying you can do it in other ways. I remember that um, we had the survey that you're, well, one of the surveys that we created was for school students. So we changed the language to be slightly more simple and um, we just grabbed a whole lot of kids in their lunch breaks. And, That's um, right. And what they would like to see in the future um, for their town yes. or what they like the most about their town at the moment. Yeah, so I think with Marie's, um, for Marie's question, <coughs> the answer would be, as you say, you know, it's, it's, you know, three hours. We, I think we asked five or six questions over three hours, but we had 80 people in the room. We provided um, a substantial meal break because this was not just about getting the data that we needed and running away. It was about a, you know, heralding major changes. Um, and, and a major process that the council was initiating. So three hours, you know, and that was from, I think, 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. With, with, a, with a meal provided. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really uh, signalling that this was a, a big and um, substantial important process. So, but then ask fewer questions, I'd say. If you don't have three hours, then, Go back to your, your 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 blank sheet of paper and do your design work around what you think might be a um, you know an appropriate amount of time to achieve the task and uh, or to complete the task and you know and design accordingly. You know, coming back to those basic appreciative inquiry principles of focusing on the positive. Yeah. And yeah. asking questions in positive ways. And so far, you've outlined two ways um, that you've seen this done in terms of techniques. One is in surveys and the other is in sort of big group forums. And I might just add, because I was there, so I sort of know what happened, that those three or 400 people in a room didn't all sit in chairs facing the front. They were sitting in small groups around a meal with two staff members who were documenting um, the answers to the questions and not deviating from asking the questions because was easy for staff to say, well, that's a ridiculous idea. <laughs> um, right. And the thing is, too, that, you know, this was a, what I designed this as a capacity building program or a capacity building initiative for councils. So the what I did to start with was train staff, council staff um, in these processes because the, um, you know, I was working a lot with rural councils that just didn't have the resources for a swathe of of uh, of consultants to come in and you know run run the show for them, but it was also a, ve a very valuable exercise. I would advocate that councils you know, or any anybody uh, any any organisation doesn't throw things out to consultants all the time. It uses its own staff and its own resources, um, you know, to to achieve these ends. So. What I did was I went in and spent quite a while training staff in facilitation, in effective facilitation um, and in appreciative inquiry so that the staff who were actually um, working in the forum, uh, in each forum, understood exactly what they were doing. So it wasn't just a matter of, you know, ro robotically asking questions and recording the answers. They really knew why they were there. They knew what we were trying to achieve. They knew they understood the benefits of the appreciative inquiry process. They knew why the questions were uh, had been designed in the way that they had been, um, and which meant that they were well equipped to go and ask, you know, to, to go to uh, conduct this process. And so I was one consultant, uh, one outside uh, provider working with uh, each council in all of these different um, circumstances, over a dozen councils. And uh, and in in each case, in each and every case, uh, talked all this uh, design through with the elected councillors and then the senior staff. It all made sense to them because it's pretty sort of you know elements of it were pretty straightforward. And then the council went away and got twenty or eighteen or twenty staff, and then I trained them. Um, and then we all went out and did this together. So at the forums, the actual design of the forums. Um, 
the questions were asked to tables of around about eight or ten people uh, and so that basically the eight or ten uh, per table gave people a chance to really to, to talk you know people are often reticent to stand up in a room of a hundred people and say something but in a small group of eight or ten where they've introduced themselves they probably know each other to some extent and so on people are a lot more comfortable to actually talk more freely and so that's the, that was a very deliberate design um, aspect of the, the, the process uh, and, and it also meant that staff were much more able to manage the discussion process and I was there in the room throughout the whole thing and walked around and I was a bit of a uh, I was the policeman along with the, the general manager uh, the head of the council we were the kind of police and and there were let me see uh, look in 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 three years of doing this I could count Probably there were two people, three people who came to, who come to mind as people who tried to sort of disturb or, or send the process off track. So when you actually consider over a period of two or three years, uh, thousands of people involved and three people, three people who actually tried to um, say hijack the process. Uh, it was momentary. One of those people actually was a was a, a mayor <laughs> so arguably not a not a, a, a community participant but a but a, a mayor um, uh, of one of the councils so it's you know with the proper training and the proper design it's it is very very easy to manage successfully sure um, another question which obviously goes straight on from that is how does the appreciative inquiry process handle all the feedback that comes back to them. Okay. Well, then, basically, you're leaving. You're departing from. You, you've appreciative inquiry is only about only extends into how you interact with your communities and how you how you obtain data. So once you've got the data, it is then up to you to determine what you do with it. So what we what we did uh, in what I did with in, with uh, in each case here was to. Get, put the data into a uh, into a, a a database actually, and Joe was the person who uh, who uh, developed or designed and developed that database. Um, and, and then we started to um, categorize the data. Now we, when I say the the we bit is very important because we had staff and we had counselors there. So staff who were, you know, administer the processes, councillors who represent communities, and together we may we sort of formed, we kind of crystallised the data, we grouped the data in under common themes. So we developed seven themes that represented, you know, that would encapsulate everything that would happen in a council area. Um, and those seven themes were, I think, from the top of mind, uh, community and culture, uh, local environment, uh, local economy, uh, uh, urban and urban and uh, rural and urban environment, um, infrastructure and and uh, infrastructure and services, and and governance. I think that was that they were the they were the categories. So that's pretty much uh, through long deliberation, we kind of determined that that was ev you know everything that happened in a in a in a council area and in their communities could be categorised within those seven categories. Could be could find a home within those seven categories. So once we actually got those seven categories, then we started to group the data. We started to look for common themes. We started to look for common uh, common statements. And so on, and we built a picture of, you know, life now and in the future uh, in the council area, um, you know, through examining what was categorised, what we had placed in those seven categories. But but bear in mind there that, firstly, you've you've let that, that's no longer working in the appreciative inquiry thing. The appreciative the appreciative inquiry. Uh, process was a tool for gathering the data, for assembling the data. But then what you do with the data is then entirely up to you. I mean, some um, 
there are there are there are, there's now software that will uh, do all this stuff for you. Personally, I I like a process where you don't actually rely on software. You actually get a bunch of people sitting in a room, and it's about the makeup of those people. You know, it's about the the uh, who who is who is in the room doing the data analysis, and 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 who they you know and what interests they represent. So um, I'm just aware of the time, Martin. Um, there's been a couple of people saying, what time are we planning to finish? And we probably would have finished by now if we hadn't had some glitches at the beginning. Um, there was a really interesting conversation that took place about um, doing some triage um, in fire zones where after, or after massive natural disasters and um, how appreciative inquiry would fit into that framework. Have you had much experience in seeing an appreciative inquiry done after a natural disaster or man no 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 look i <coughs> i haven't actually um but uh what i would say is that i can see certainly the application uh of that um you know in in that kind of scenario um and it's really a matter of applying the design principles it's we, I mean, look, with any engagement process, to some extent, you have to start at the end. Uh, by And by that, I mean, you have to actually start off by saying to yourselves or asking yourselves the question, what do we need to achieve here? What do we, like, do, what do we need, to, what data do we need to a, a, a obtain? What are we trying to achieve? Once you've actually got those end goals clarified you then design the process that will achieve it so then if you decide okay well i want to see how i can apply appreciative inquiry to this to achieve that then you start doing the appreciative inquiry design to achieve that so it's all about the end goals what do what do you need to walk away with it the in the end some you know, in that kind of scenario where I was working with the councils, we what we needed to achieve basically was a 20-year community strategic plan. Um, so, you know, there would, of course, be situations where you look at it and you sort of think, well, okay, no, I cannot see appreciative how appreciative inquiry uh, might, be, might, might uh, um, address the issues I need to deal with right now, you know. Um, but uh, so it's you know it it would be a matter of of figuring out what you what you need to do and then looking at um, whether or not appreciative inquiry is uh, is is something that would help be able to help you achieve it. Yeah, and I guess um, sort of in in summary of that, appreciative inquiry is something that can be applied to a series of techniques. Um, but it's really about a mindset of first of all find out what people want, um, find out what people already like. And finding out how people want to move forward, and that you can use that. Yes, that's uh, right. In a, in a variety of settings, um, over a short or long periods of time, with yep. small or large groups, um, and then obviously the techniques that you need. Say, for example, surveys will still be needed to ask appreciative inquiry questions. But it is about um, asking yourself the question: Is the question that I just asked making having a deficit model? Um, or is it having a model that expands? What yes. We yes, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> with something like a community vision, you know, you really do want to get to a point where you want, you know, it's it will of course be a vision for a better for a better area, a better community, a better world, whatever you know. But with something like uh, you know a natural disaster. You've got to think carefully. Well, what do we actually want to know? What do we? What do we? What do we? What do we need to? If we want to involve communities in some sort of get some sort of engagement process uh, to assess what we've done and how we might be able to improve it next time, um, or how you know what what we can do to make communities more resilient through natural disasters and that sort of thing. Yep. Well, then it's just really a matter of understanding. Um, uh, coming back to that point of understanding appreciative inquiry and then determining, you know, um, how do we actually, how, how, might, how, how might we be able to uh, apply this methodology to, uh, to, to achieve those ends? 
Yeah. So I'm just aware of the time. Um, is And I haven't had any last questions. Actually, Marie sort of summed it up. She said what people value is the key thing that she's picked up out of all of this. Um, yes. And I'm, I'm thinking, um, given the time and given that we've had a number of people put in their apologies and say that they need to leave, we might, we might end soon. But I was just wondering, first of all, if you had any final thoughts or words, Martin, that you wanted to say, and just to let everyone know that this will be recorded and we'll edit out the um, waiting time and we'll send you through a link with some really good appreciative inquiry um, websites as well. And Martin, if you're happy, I'm, I might also send out information about how people can contact you. So yes, I'll link to the service as well if they have further questions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So just um, if you want to have a go, Martin, at summarising um, what you think people could take away <laughs> from the inquiry. Um, yes. Okay, look, I would, I would probably summarise, summarise it like this. I would say that appreciative inquiry is probably the most powerful engagement tool I have, um, I have witnessed and, and, and used. Um, it's, what I would say to everybody is trust the capacity of your communities or whoever you're involving to, to deliver sound and, and sensible contributions. You've got to do that. Um, and the, 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 the opportunity that Appreciative Inquiry gives you to move away from this antagonistic, uh, combative kind of setting where that, that inevitably uh, kind of cloud, put, brings a cloud over engagement processes when you actually start sinking into this quagmire of what, tell us about all the things that are broken, you know, tell us how bad we are, tell us about how bad your local area, tell us everything you have to endure, you know, living here or involved in this or that or whatever. People find it refreshing to step away from that and, and they find that they, in all my experience with this said, they absolutely love the opportunity to, to talk positively to actually, you know, as a process of affirmation, taken on trust that this was this, you know, what they contributed was going to be used to 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 build a better future for for local communities in 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 you know a, 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 a number of ways, all the ways that you know everything that happens in the community. But but for engagement processes, I would. I would very strongly recommend some some detailed um, research into appreciative inquiry and to see what you might be able to do to actually test it uh, in engagement activities to see how how powerful it can be. So thanks, Martin, for your time. I really appreciate um, you taking time out of your quite busy schedule. I know to explain to people about appreciative inquiry and I thought I'd better get it from you because that's where I learnt it from in the first place. No, um, thanks, Dale. Look, I just I, I want to say also sorry about the technological problems. I, I it was it was all a bit of a mystery to me, but thank goodness we got here in the end and thank you everybody for staying on the line and having faith that something good might happen, which it which which you know and it did. So <laughs> I'm appreciative of that. <laughs> so thank you everyone, we appreciate you coming and we will uh, send these recordings out to you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.